This is the Reformed Libertarians Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute with Kerry Baldwin and Gregory Baus. We explore free society from a Reformed perspective. You can find us at reformedlibertarians.com. We talk about culture, society, politics, economics, theology, philosophy, worldview, and more, helping those interested in liberty and human flourishing to think about them based in the Reformed faith. This is episode six, and we're discussing the Reformed Doctrine of the Right of Political Resistance. I'm Carrie Baldwin here with Gregory Baus, and we'll be talking about what the right of political resistance is, at least four reasons why it's important, and a little about the early church roots of this teaching in John Chrysostom. So what is the right of political resistance? We cover the historical confessional reform teaching on Romans 13 in episode two that really serves as a necessary introduction to what we will say in this episode. So we encourage you to listen to that first. And we link to episode two in the show notes. Briefly, the historical confessional reform teaching on the right of political resistance is this. Since, according to scripture, God prescriptively ordains the administration of civil justice and civil governance is strictly limited to this task, We are therefore only obligated to submit to actual civil justice. The claim to civil power or exercise of power that violates civil justice is not ordained by God and may be legitimately resisted. It is not only orders to sin that must be refused, but any civil requirement beyond the God-ordained sphere of civil justice may, when not otherwise sinful, be justly ignored. According to scripture, God does not ordain tyranny or any injustice and does not obligate anyone to consciously submit to such a thing. So Gregory, how do the Reformed Confessions actually teach the right of political resistance? The Confessions and other doctrinal standards of the Reformed churches in accordance with the Bible affirm that unlawful power and unjust exercise of power is tyranny and may be legitimately resisted because it is not ordained by God, and so no one can be obligated to submit to it. For example, the Westminster Confession of Faith specifies that those who, quote, oppose any lawful power or the lawful exercise of it resist the ordinance of God. Just to be clear, lawful in the confessional sense doesn't mean legal or consistent with particular human legislation. It means according to God's standards or ordinances. So this entails that resisting unlawful power or the unlawful exercise of power does not constitute resisting the ordinance of God. The Belgic Confession specifies obedience only to, quote, things that are not in conflict with God's word and denounces all, even civil powers, who would, quote, subvert justice. If, then, those claiming or wielding civil power are violating God's ordinance by punishing the good rather than the bad and thus subverting justice, then that would be in conflict with God's word. And so there's no obligation to obedience in such matters. The second Helvetic Confession of Faith similarly specifies obedience only to, quote, just and fair commands. Very clearly, when those claiming or wielding civil power are issuing unjust and unfair commands, it also follows that, No obedience is due in such matters. For good measure, we can mention that the Congregationalist Savoy Declaration and the Baptist London Confession in their chapters 24, that echo Westminster Confession chapter 23, they speak of obeying only lawful commands. This is to the same effect. Namely, that as unlawful commands are contrary to the ordinance of God, resistance to such commands is in no way to resist God's ordinance. 
and there is no obligation to obey in those cases. We'll also link again in the show notes to an annotated bibliography that documents this teaching from Reformed theologians and churchmen. So, Kerry, we've thought of at least four reasons that the doctrine of the right of political resistance, while not a so-called gospel issue, that is, one can be wrong about it and still get the gospel right, is nevertheless a very important biblical confessional teaching. What's at least one of those reasons? Yeah, so I would say one reason the doctrine of the right of political resistance is so important is, first of all, it's an ethical matter of non-indifference. So when something is neither commanded or forbidden by God, for example, an action like wearing a raincoat today or using an electric stove rather than a gas range to cook one's food, we call such things adiaphora or morally indifferent. However, political resistance is not indifferent in the sense that it is a matter positively moral or immoral. It's addressed in scripture and in our Reformed doctrinal statements. Scripture and the confession make clear we are forbidden by God to resist his ordinance of civil justice or lawfulness. We are obligated to obey commands that are just. And further, we are morally permitted to resist civil injustice. It is lawful to disobey what is unlawful. So Gregory, when a matter of ethics or morality, which the doctrine of the right of political resistance addresses, is taught in scripture and in the church's confessions, then that entails certain consequences for the church. What would one of those consequences be? One consequence of the right of political resistance being taught in scripture and in the confessions of the Reformed churches is a second reason this doctrine is so important. That consequence is this. As a doctrine taught in God's word and in the Reformed confessions, it is, therefore, not something about which the officers of the church must remain silent, but rather it's something about which they are obligated to teach and discipline. The authority of the church is exclusively ministerial and declarative. We may not legislate and enforce man-made worship beliefs or morality. And ministers and ruling elders are obligated to teach the whole counsel of God, all of Scripture, and to govern accordingly. Since the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, our only infallible rule of faith and life, church ministers are obligated to teach the Bible the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, and they may not refrain from doing so. And that means the doctrine of the right of political resistance is something they are required to teach. It is non-optional. And further, they are required to correct those who contradict it. And those who teach contrary to it are disqualified from special office in the church and should be removed if they continue holding to such error. That's a second reason this doctrine is so important. I don't know if you've gotten the same impression, but it has seemed to me when I've heard ministers raise the issue from time to time, some think that permissible resistance to civil powers would have to be something extremely rare. Of course, they probably have in mind the erroneous view we discussed in episode two, that resistance is only called for if someone is requiring you to sin. That's the erroneous view. But Carrie, how would this relate to another reason this doctrine is so important? Well, the other reason why this doctrine, this right of political resistance is so important is that Contrary to popular teaching, it is frequently encountered as an ethical matter. Christians must make choices nearly on a daily basis that may be informed by one's beliefs on this matter of political resistance. So contrary to much of what 
we might hear being in a position of exercising one's rights to resist those who currently wield coercive power is neither a rare circumstance, nor is it a last resort. Some examples include feeding the poor without a government permit, purchasing unapproved baby formula because of shortages caused by overregulation, establishing a homeless shelter without government zoning approval, as was the case in Gastonia, North Carolina recently, which Spike Cohen highlights in an episode on the Libertarian Christian podcast. These are all very real examples. We'll link them in the show notes, but they're all very real examples of having to resist political injustice. In the face of any injustice, the God-given norm of justice calls for what is phrased in Latin, obsta principis, that is, obstruct or oppose, standing against the very beginnings or first small manifestation of injustice. So in other words, nip it in the bud. The way to deal with abuses of power is not to accommodate it to keep falling back over and over until it's too late and there's nothing you can do about it. You should resist it from the start. I've heard some prominent theologians and pastors say we should bend over backwards for the state. Incidentally, this is the same advice they give spouses in abusive marriages. This is exactly the wrong advice to give. That's being an enabler of evil. The United States government and the governments of particular states and local governments commit injustices on a regular basis, whether it's violating their own constitutions or enforcing unjust laws. And whenever they seek to deny or infringe anyone's rights, a proper response is uncompromising and immediate resistance as possible. But this is not to say that we should throw away our lives, liberty or property over nothing or over lesser things. There are indeed prudential considerations in strategic defense, but those prudential considerations should not override our commitment to being good stewards of what God has given us or to loving our neighbors by daily resistance to the state's tyranny. So far, we've mentioned how the right of political resistance is such an important doctrine because one, it is a non-indifferent moral issue taught in scripture and the Reformed confessions. Two. That means church teachers are obligated to instruct the church in it as the teaching of God's word. And three, because political resistance is a frequently encountered moral issue. So Gregory, what would be a fourth reason for this doctrine's importance? Well, I was just thinking again about that Latin phrase, opsta principis, that might make for another good t-shirt. I've lo- <laughs> a lost count now of the of the Latin phrases. I need to get on that. We're going to put on (laughs) t-shirts. Okay. For a fourth reason that this doctrine is so important, this might be considered another consequence of the doctrine being taught in scripture and in the Reformed confessions of Reformed churches. The fourth reason this doctrine is important is that it's a matter of the church's faithful witness to the truth of God's word. Misrepresentations of scripture can be a major unwarranted stumbling block before unbelievers to the call of the gospel and to the consciences of believers. It's one of the church's primary tasks to continue faithfully witnessing to the truth as it is in Jesus revealed in the Bible. If there is some hindrance to a lost sinner, responding in faith, it should be on account of the truth that is because they reject what is true, not because the church is failing to present the truth of scripture accurately. If a minister says the Bible teaches X, say, for example, that the sun revolves around the earth and someone knows that's false, and the Bible doesn't teach that, which of course it doesn't, then to say the Bible teaches that is false teaching and sets up a serious, unnecessary obstacle to hearing the gospel because you've presented God's word to be something false. The Bible doesn't teach 
that anyone is obligated to submit to tyrants or unjust laws. And if a minister were to say such a thing is taught in scripture, then that constitutes setting up an illegitimate stumbling block to gospel proclamation. Further, God alone is Lord of the conscience. He leaves us free from man-made doctrines and commandments if they are contrary to scripture or if they are other than scripture in matters of faith or worship. This is to say that ministers and elders who teach contrary to the Bible's teaching of the right of political resistance presume to bind the conscience upon their own authority. Ironically, that is spiritual tyranny to match the political tyranny to which they are requiring slavery. Yeah, shamefully, this doctrine of political resistance isn't much taught anymore in confessional Presbyterian and Reform seminaries and is largely ignored, even contradicted, in numerous Presbyterian and Reform churches today. There's a prominent need for not only Reformed church laity, but also church officers, ministers, elders, and deacons to gain a greater familiarity with the historical confessional reform teaching on the right of political resistance. So given the great need for renewed awareness of this doctrine and its importance, we hope to make it more accessible by presenting vignettes of several reformed authors and their statements from an annotated bibliography on the topic of the right of political resistance. And those will be linked in the show notes. In this episode, however, we'd like to tell you a little bit about Pastor John Chrysostom and his early church contribution. Let me first set something of the context of Chrysostom's life. Chrysostom lived about 347 to 407. He was born in Antioch of Syria, as it's called, the city of Paul's sending church, where believers were first called Christians, as you know. You can see where that is on a Bible map, probably, known today as something like Antakya. I'm guessing it's pronounced in the very south of the middle of present-day Turkey, although this was well before any Turkic peoples had migrated to Turkey, of course. It's along the Orontes River near the Mediterranean Sea, right by the northwest border of present-day Syria. Chrysostom was raised there by his Christian mother, his father having died not long after his birth, Prior to Chrysostom's birth, the Roman Emperor Constantine I, beginning his reign in 306 with several co-regents for a time, converted to Christianity and in 313 decriminalized Christianity in the empire. This was about 45 years before Chrysostom's birth. Constantine convened the Church Council of Nicaea in 325 and in 330, he established a second capital on the empire's eastern side, renaming it Constantinople, of course, known as Istanbul today. While when Chrysostom was a teenager, the emperor Julian, around 360, sought to revitalize paganism as the empire's religion, his efforts didn't last. The emperor Theodosius I convened the Church Council of Constantinople in 381, and by about 390, about 20 years before Chrysostom's death, Theodosius had variously outlawed the public practice of pagan rituals and heretical or schismatic Christian sects, such as Arianism and Donatism, and in 395 upon Theodosius's death, when Chrysostom was almost 50 years old, the Roman Empire was split with Honorius as emperor in the west and Arcadius as emperor in the east. So that's the context there. <laughs> 
Yeah. So from around age 13, Chrysostom studied for a time under the pagan teacher Libanius. However, around age 23, Chrysostom was baptized and was appointed as a reader in the church, and he studied theology under Diodorus. When he was about 28, he began living as an ascetic hermit, but after two years, he returned to Antioch. Four years later, he was ordained as a deacon at the age of 34. And in 386, at the age of 39, Chrysostom was ordained as a pastor. He pastored in Antioch for about 12 years. And in 398, at the age of 51, he was appointed archbishop in Constantinople. In both Antioch and Constantinople, Chrysostom continually exposited scripture for his congregants. Further, he ensured that offerings went to help those in need rather than to enrich himself or to adorn church property or to wine and dine officials. And he established hospitals. He also spoke against abuses and injustices by those in power. Within six years of his pastoral ministry in Constantinople, this is about 404, Eudoxia, the emperor Arcadius's wife, conspired to have Chrysostom convicted on bogus charges and exiled. Then again in 407, at age 60, he was forced to march even further into exile and died en route as a martyr. Chrysostom was a contemporary of Cyril of Jerusalem, Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, Athanasius, and the Cappadocians, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory of Nyssa, among other notable patristics. Many of his sermons and writings are available today and have influenced small o Orthodox Christian theology in both the East and the West, of crucial importance to the understanding of the right of political resistance in Reformed Protestant theology is Chrysostom's 23rd homily on the Epistle to the Romans concerning chapter 13. So there, Chrysostom says, quote, For there is no power, Paul says, but of God. What say you? It may be said, Is every ruler then elected of God? This I do not say, he answers nor am I now speaking about individual rulers, but about the thing, that is, civil governance, itself. The Reformed observed that Chrysostom shared their own understanding of the teaching of Scripture, which they confess in their doctrinal standards. In Romans 13 and similar passages, God does not obligate us to submit to de facto rulers. Rather, God prescriptively ordains an office of administering civil justice, and therefore, it is permissible to resist those who unjustly claim power or who wield power for injustice. The right of political resistance is a biblical teaching that, as many Christians before us have done, can be recovered and embraced today. Thanks for listening to the Reformed Libertarians podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute with Carrie Baldwin and Gregory Baus. See the website for each episode's show notes and sign up for our email list. Don't forget to rate and review Reformed Libertarians podcast on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcatcher. Find our email and social media on our contact page at reformedlibertarians.com.